I'm delighted to see you all, and thank you so much for coming. I'm Teresa Mangum. I'm a faculty member, and I'm also the director of the Oberman Center for Advanced Studies, which if you kept going down Clinton Street, you would turn around to Church Street, and we we're right across from the President's House. And the center supports faculty research. We also provide some support for graduate student projects. But one of the things we work on a lot is finding ways to get our faculty and grad students out in the community to share the work they're doing with the larger public. Um, this Friday, for example, at the Public Library from 3 to 6, Michael and Lena Hill, who are professors in African American Studies and English, are going to uh, have a whole panel of Af African American alumni to talk about their experience at the University of Iowa back in the 30s through the 60s. So we do a lot of programs like that. We were thrilled when Glenn Erstein, today's speaker, and two of his colleagues, uh, Glenn Penny, from history and Lisa Heineman from history came to us and proposed um, being the faculty in, in charge of our annual humanities symposium and they had already started to work on Germans in Iowa with their students and they came up with not only a conference, but an extravaganza. And if you have not yet been to the Old Capitol Senate, you should go and see that exhibit while it's still there. Glenn can tell you a little more about that. So let me tell you a bit about our speaker, and then I will sit down and we'll have a feast for the eyes as well as the ears here in a second. Um, today's presenter is Glenn Erstein. Erstein, uh, who's an associate professor of German literature at the University of Iowa. He's been here since 1994. German immigration to Iowa is a pretty new field for Glenn, unlike um, a couple of the other two organizers who had done a bit of work, uh, especially Glenn Penny in history. <clears throat> but Glenn jumped in, this Glenn, jumped in with both feet. His main research interests up until now have been theater, the performance traditions of Mardi Gras, and the cultural transformations that took place between the late Middle Ages and the Protestant Reformation. And he, his first book, titled Theater, Culture, and Community in Reformation Burn, 1523 to 1555, was awarded the 2003 David Bevington Award for the best new book in early drama studies. Um, that was an award given by the Medieval and Renaissance Drama Society. For the German Iowa and the Global Midwest project that you're going to hear about today, um, Glenn has, spent, has begun to do research on over 60 German language newspapers right here in Iowa, published between 1853 and 1973. His talk today, German Iowans and the Politics of Brewing, draws upon newspaper material from Des Moines, Dubuque, Carroll, Waverly, and Iowa City. Please join me in welcoming Glenn Erstein. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Um, today's um, talk is going to be taped, videotaped, and so um, I'm, I'm not going to move too much here, uh, and I have certain technological devices here which will help me and I, I hope to wield them uh, authoritatively here. Um, I'd like to thank Teresa very much for that kind introduction. I'd like to thank all of you very, very much for coming. Uh, Teresa mentioned what my primary research uh, field is. I can assure you I do not have this crowd when I talk about, for example, Corpus Christi plays in 15th century Germany. <laughs> And, and relics. So this uh, opportunity or this project really has been a very welcome opportunity for me to get involved with public outreach, public humanities. Um, it's part of this larger project that I'm doing with Glenn Penny and Lisa Heinemann of the Department of History here on campus. Um, we're reaching out to a variety of communities. The exhibit that's currently on display in the Old Capitol Museum will actually be going on the road in 2017. But before I get into all of that, I'll save the discussion of the project itself for the Q&A session and some of my closing remarks. So I'd like to just dive right in to today's topic, which indeed is German Iowans and the politics of brewing. Um, I'd like to set the stage, if you will, by taking you back to a time in history 
when, oh, that's my, okay, that's my intro slide, uh, and I'll, I'll thank Marlon Ingalls for helping me to identify some of these individuals here. Let's see, is the pointer actually even, well, my apologies for that. Okay, um, we talked to Marlon Ingalls, and Marlon, you can tell us maybe later about who some of these people are. Uh, Coopers, uh, cask fillers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, actually, I don't want to forget this page as well. In addition to thanking Teresa for her support from the Oberman Center for Humanities, I'd also very much like to thank Jade Monter Maternak. Okay, I would, of course, say Montanach. Um, and also the Provost Office of Outreach and Engagement, which is sponsoring today's talk. We have incurred many other debts um, in a very positive sense here. Um, through the campus support for our project. So I encourage you to uh, read through, uh, but I do want to get right to our topic. So let me set the stage for you by taking you back in time to Iowa City around 1890, uh, 1900. This was a time where the state of Iowa actively promoted immigration to the state uh, going back to the founding of the Iowa State Board of Immigration in 1870 and the publication of a pamphlet here, Iowa, the Home for Immigrants, in German, Danish, Swedish, and Dutch. And they actively had, the state had agents stationed in Copenhagen, in uh, Hamburg, in London, in Amsterdam to recruit immigrants to the state. So the state was very interested in having immigrants come um, the German immigrants uh, brought with them you know, uh, a thriving newspaper culture, uh, and they founded here over 60 newspapers throughout the state, uh, which survived for the most part up until uh, World War I. Uh, we'll close with World War I uh, in a moment. And um, if you will, you can think of these newspapers as the Telemundo of their day. This was how Germans uh, and the, the immigrant community, German language immigrant community, uh, supported, the, talked about the news of the day, got their information, et cetera, et cetera. And through our project, um, we have realized that to some degree, a large portion of the history of the state, certainly the political discourse that was occurring among German immigrants, it's taking place in these German language newspapers. And in order to access that, um, you have to both read German and read this old Gothic font, which my students also um, are not thrilled about. But if you can read the, the Gothic font, I can, uh, I'm assuming you can read the Iowa City uh, here. Um, I, uh, was, I lived in town for over 20 years until I began this project and realized that Iowa City had, over time, not just one, not just two, but three German language newspapers that survived up until 1903. And then the Iowa City Post here was the main one that um, uh, around 1903 went up to Cedar Rapids where it continued publication as the Iowa Post, Post until um, 1917. Um, this is also a time when Iowa City had many immigrant business owners, uh, prominent business owners who had seats on the city council and here we have, for example, Henry Wienicke. Uh, he was actually born in Ohio uh, to German parents. Uh, he was a member of the Zion Lutheran congregation. And he was um, first the manager and then later the owner of what was known as Fink's Bazaar, Cigars and Notions. And every time you walk into Iowa Book and Supply today, you are walking past the historic location of that uh, now cliched uh, uh, Indian uh, cigar store, Indian, um, which was um, part of the standard repertoire for cigar stores at the time. Um, not only were uh, local businesses owned by Germans and other immigrants, um, customers, uh, Iowa City was a polyglot community so that the savvy business owner knew to advertise not only in English, but also in German, as well as check. Oops, I sorry, click twice. Uh, so right here, we have, for this Fink's Bazaar, we have three different advertisements, um, both in English, or three times English, German, and Czech. So Iowa City really is a polyglot community. All of these immigrants, they are, they're immigrants. They bring with them their own cultures, their own habits. Um, these cultural habits are often distinct from the 
uh, largely Anglophone and Anglophile uh, immigrants, or probably not even immigrants, uh, residents of the state who f um, a lot of the early residents of Iowa are coming from the East Coast. They're coming from uh, Protestant backgrounds, Puritan backgrounds. A lot of the Germans in Iowa, particularly around Dubuque, but also in Iowa City, are German Catholics. Uh, pretty much all the brewers in town were Catholics. And so um, I, I, I know we have a couple experts on the local brewing scene here in the audience today. So um, thank you. Uh, and Marlon, I'd like to particularly point out Marlon Ingalls of the um, Office of the State Archaeologist here, who's done a lot of research on that. So we have um, three different brewers here in town. Um, it's not an accident that you know this name already, Louis Englert. Eng Louis Englert was the patriarch of the Englert family. Uh, he comes up uh, before the railroads get to Iowa. The easiest way to get to Iowa was via New Orleans. So he took his boat from, I believe, Hamburg to New Orleans and then came up the Mississippi and then uh, came to Iowa City where he founded Iowa City's first brewery. This is actually the second generation, John J. Englert, and it's the third generation that then founds the Englert Theater um, here in town. You can see the location here, Market Street, Marketstrasse in Iowa City. But there were two other breweries. Um, here is the Dostal Brewery, the Great Western Brewery, later known here as the Iowa Brewing Company. And if you can mentally place yourself on the corner of Lynn and Market Street looking east, this here is where George's now stands. I'm sorry, the laser pointer is a little faint, but here, this is the current location of George's. This is the current location of Bluebird Diner. Um, there is now a parking lot in between those two locations. The reason there is a parking lot is that this brewery, as uh, pretty much all the other breweries in town, had cellars, beer caves, where they stored the beer uh, before they shipped it out. So um, unless, uh, as if I understand correctly, Iowa City real estate is now getting to the point where soon, perhaps, it's going to be worth a developer's uh, economic investment to actually go in, dig up those beer caves, and then put up perhaps a new apartment building or a uh, business complex there. Um, for the time being, however, you can't build anything uh, too tall there until you excavate out those beer caves. And uh, that parking lot has been known to swallow an SUV from uh, time to time. Uh, I, and Marlon, thank you for confirming that recently. <laughs> Um, but uh, all of you are, know, at least in one way, shape, or form, this building here, now the location of LeJames International College. Uh, this was the location of the Union Brewery of Konrad Graf, and this is the, um, the only brewery that's still left standing here. So there's a reason this is called Brewery Square, the whole development. Um, we have, um, after a prohibition, ec economy printing, uh, purchased this building and built the, the structure next door where um, Lynn Street Cafe used to be and Devotee is now. Uh, and because they were able to find an economic use for the building, that's why this building has survived. And then it, uh, in urban renovation, renewal, it uh, was renovated then. So these are Iowa City's three breweries. So obviously, Germans bring you know, the art of brewing with them. They also bring their cultural habits. Um, surrounding beer. Uh, and from the German perspective, beer drinking was not saloon culture. Beer drinking was not, uh, there was no uh, discrepancy or um, uh, paradox, if you will, between um, Sunday sacred concerts and having a beer. So uh, this is, uh, these are scenes from New York here. This is one of the prominent uh, beer gardens here in New York, but what Germans would do, Ger Sunday recreation for Germans included going to a beer garden, going, you know, either indoor or outdoor, and listening to classical music, listening to um, an opera or watching a theater performance. In other words, um, this beer was not, um, beer was not at odds with high culture. Okay? Of course, from other perspectives, drinking beer on Sunday was considered literally sacrilegious. And this pertained not just to the Germans, but to the Irish, 
who made up uh, Iowa's second largest uh, immigrant community. Germans actually, uh, at uh, one point, Germans were always from 1850 through 1970, if, if we've got the right data, the largest immigrant, immigrant group uh, within Iowa, even as the, the overall numbers of immigrants drop. So it's uh, Germans, the Irish, and uh, the, the British who find their way to Iowa across the Atlantic. Local American-born um, Protestants, largely, um, were very um, adverse or um, had their issues, shall we say, with German and Irish drinking culture, which explains in part the temperance movement uh, here. And of course, as you can imagine, uh, from anyone with a religious background, this idea that you would engage in drinking on a Sunday, this really was blasphemous. Hence the zeal with which Carrie Nation and other advocates of temperance, not just women, but many, many women, um, the zeal with which they sought to suppress alcohol. And indeed, um, there were issues such as wife beating, um, you know, squandering of family resources, et cetera, et cetera. This wasn't, they, they, they took issue with drinking, not just because of drinking itself, but because of the social ills that it could produce. So um, temperance advocates were very determined to uh, eradicate as much as possible or suppress drinking. And um, they, as we'll see, get the ear of the uh, Republican Party and uh, as their political strength grows, they are able to enact prohibition legislation. But here, just to give you, again, a, a local perspective, so Iowa has its own women's Christian temperance union. Okay, it's uh, founded, I believe, um, I believe it's 1870, I, I'm, I'm not recalling that date, but as you can see here, the local Johnson County Women's Christian Temperance Union was founded in 1875. Among other things, if you were today, if they were around today and you went to the Johnson County Fair, um, what they would probably do if you were enjoying an alcoholic beverage at uh, the fairgrounds, um, they would probably come up to you and uh, encourage you to either not purchase your alcoholic beverage in the, in the first place or dump it out. Um, and they had other ways of um, uh, encouraging pub owners, saloon owners, to dump out their stores of alcohol as well. So a, a common method, a common um, procedure, if you will, um, these women would meet at a local church, Protestant church, hold a prayer uh, session, and then they would proceed from the church to whichever saloon or set of saloons that they might have been targeting at any given time. And they would then uh, gather around, sing hymns, uh, perhaps hold another prayer vigil. And the saloon owner inside knew that uh, th this was the, the time for the saloon owner to consider, OK, am I going to um, comply with these women? Or uh, shall, I, um, shall I not engage them? And uh, at which point they might actually come into my establishment and with their hatchets, um, wreak havoc uh, on, on my establishment. So this particular uh, saloon owner here, this is not uh, a member of the actual uh, temperance group. Uh, this is here from 1876, um, if I've got that right, from um, Frank Leslie's Illustrated Newspaper, illustrating an event in Ohio where this particular saloon owner um, you know, saw the light, if you will, and realized that it was probably in his own interest to destroy his own supply of whiskey and bourbon rather than have these women come in and do any other damage to his establishment. We know, thanks to the German press, and I'm sure this is reported in the English press, but uh, as Teresa told you, um, our, for our project, one reason I was involved, I'm, I'm the representative of the German department here, we wanted students to be able to go and look at the German language sources. So the history students could easily access the um, you know, uh, English language newspapers, other English language sources. Some of them could also access the German language sor uh, sources. Students in German, their task was to access the German language sources. So here is the first newspaper article we have. And I believe some of you had the opportunity to pick up the handout. Uh, and I'll just 
if you have this, this is the first article that you have on your handout here. Um, I won't go through and read this because uh, I want to make sure we make good use of time, but I'll just, pardon me, I'll point out that here at the bottom, uh, in this particular case, this was not an issue of hatchets uh, being taken to the establishment, uh, but in this particular case, these women uh, took a torch to this particular saloon. The saloon owner was trying to comply with the new 1884 prohibition law. He moved his establishment across the Missouri, uh, probably across the Des Moines River into Missouri. And these, the local Iowa temperance advocates, they followed him, or they at least, um, they followed the, his clientele, which of course could easily go from Iowa across the river into Missouri. Uh, and they were not appreciative of the fact that he escaped the prohibition law by simply moving his establishment. So um, they expressed their displeasure. Uh, if we can put it somewhat euphemistically. So um, we know that these sort of activities were going on in Iowa. And indeed, with the support of the state legislature, um, temperance advocates are able to um, enact four periods of prohibition. There are four periods where some type of temperance or prohibition legislation is in place in Iowa. Iowa is the only state in the union to have four periods of prohibition leading up to national prohibition. National prohibition uh, gets its start officially now on a nationwide level at 1920. So Iowa and a few other states uh, enacts, uh, enacts, gets ahead of the game um, locally at the state level in 1917 and enacts a prohibition law, which then just leads into the period of national prohibition as well. In our project, we've been asking ourselves as well, what makes Iowa different? How is the Iowa context different? This is one of the things that makes Iowa unique, particularly in the Midwest and the sort of traditional um, area, sort of the classical area of German immigration to the Midwest. We have reports from German immigrants saying that um, once word got out on the street that there were these temperance crazies, if you will, uh, who controlled the legislature in Iowa, according to their anecdotes, that sends German immigrants elsewhere. So possibly uh, there might even be a larger uh, percentage of German immigrants in Iowa had there not been uh, these prohibition acts. And so what I'd like to do for our remaining time is just go through and talk about German Iowan voting behavior around uh, all of these periods of, of prohibition. Um, no surprise, the prohibition legislation, its support by the Republican Party, had concrete effects on German Iowans' voting behavior. They voted Democrat. Not, um, they, they, in this long 20, 25 year period here, uh, in between the first two prohibition periods, um, you know, they supported the Civil War. Um, so they, they had reasons to vote Republican, uh, and it was actually quite a dilemma for German Iowans at time if they, for instance, ab abhorred slavery, and some of them uh, did, uh, and yet they still uh, were hoping to have a beer in the evening. Um, and these were some of the political decisions that they were required to make. So actually, we'll see here in a moment, um, German Iowans do vote Republican. Yes, Mark. Right, and, and we will be getting to all of that, and Mark, I'm, I'm glad you're here, and th I'm, I'm assuming you may have just got the email. Yeah. Uh, so thanks for coming, and um, we'll have some time to talk about that in the Q&A as well. And here, I'd like to document this a little bit for you. So there's this first period of prohibition. Um, before the Republicans were on the scene, uh, the Whigs were in charge of the state legislature, but actually the, the Democrats were actually um, the, the governor in Iowa was largely a Democratic governor up until right before the period of the uh, Civil War. So in, um, in the mid-1850s, that's when you have a Whig governor and you have a Whig legislature, which then passes this first prohibition law. The Republican Party then forms, the Whigs kind of you know, go the way of history, 
And the Republicans also are relying upon temperance votes for, um, you know, in order to, um, to gain majorities. Um, but they're, of course, they're also pro-business. Pro so what the Republican legislature does in 1857, after this initial prohibition legislation, is they modify the law and they exempted beer and wine grown from Iowa grain and fruit. Okay, and they also permitted this local option of licensing, uh, licensing saloons, and they did not enforce prohibition where local sentiment was against prohibition. So this um, idea of local option or letting local communities decide for themselves, this more or less becomes the established um, norm or the, the political compromise. And this is what certainly locally as well, German brewers, German, German uh, Iowans come to expect that, look, let's just let us decide this on a local basis. Don't enforce this statewide. Um, and this, this exempting of Iowa beer and, uh, and, um, beer and wine grown from or produced from Iowa grain and grapes speaks to the economic influence of the brewing industry in Iowa. So this is not, it's also not just a question of morals. The brewing industry provided revenue for the state. Um, the local brewers here in Iowa City and elsewhere, these were often some of the most wealthiest, some of the most influential citizens. They wielded a certain amount of political clout as well. And it's not just the brewers, farmers. Farmers gain income. In the 19th century, the cash crops of, not necessarily of choice, but certainly several Iowa farmers would not have been growing soybeans and corn. They were growing hops and barley. And we know this in part because of advertisements such as this one for the Dubuque Brewery. This was the Iowa's first brewery. And this very, the last two lines here, Pharma, mache ich darauf aufmerksam. I hereby notify farmers that I pay top market value for barley. So many of these advertisements are encouraging farmers to bring in their barley so that the brewers can you know, put it to good use. Um, now, this brings us then to the Civil War and the, uh, the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860. So even before the Civil War, 1855 to 1857, Iowa has a period of prohibition. This means that any German Iowan in, in Iowa um, knows that with his vote, and it was just his vote at this time, um, that he would be supporting, of course, um, anti-slavery party, but also a anti-alcohol or pro-prohibition party. And this was the dilemma. And we, there are a lot of anecdotes that German Americans made a strong enough voting bloc, influential enough voting bloc, to help to elect Abraham Lincoln into the presidency. This is certainly true for Illinois, Lincoln's home state. Um, up until, among other things, the 1960s in this particular article, this was the assumption for Iowa as well. And we know, for example, there are, there are communities with strong Republican support. Davenport is one of those communities. If you actually look at the voting records, it turns out that German Iowans were voting Democrat. Okay, why? Okay, and here, this is just the quote from this particular uh, author. Anyway, the problem is approached, except by taking the word of interested politicians or German intellectuals in newspapers. It seems that Iowa Germans were definitely inimical, opposed to Republican aspirations in the election of 1860. And the indications are that that study would show that the same was true in 1856. Okay, so of course, prohibition and temperance was a major factor in this, but also immigration and the, the issue of immigration in the presidential election, not unlike uh, this year's presidential election, um, th when the Republican Party was sort of constituting itself, there was also this party known as the Know Nothings, um, the American Party. And it was uh, expressly anti-immigrant. It did not want to see immigrants having voting rights, for example. German Americans, German Iowans, were American citizens. Some states actually, even after you had been naturalized, prevented new immigrants from voting for anywhere from two to five years, depending on how strict they were. Um, German Iowans also wanted to vote and wanted to have any, the, the rights that any other American citizen 
uh, would have had. So this, um, the influence of these know-nothings also made immigrants, not just German uh, islands, but uh, Irish islands, et cetera, et cetera, um, circumspect, to say the least, about voting for the Republican Party. Lincoln openly goes against the know-nothings. He disavows the know-nothings. He is very pro-immigrant. He promotes um, and uh, appoints German Americans to his cabinet, to uh, uh, military positions. Uh, several German Americans become officers in the Civil War. So this is nothing, this does not pertain to Lincoln, but it still pertains to this fear um, that existed among German Iowans regarding the uh, Republican Party. So we know, for example, that the majority of German Iowans voted Democrat in 1860. Lincoln does win Iowa as well um, by 54% of the vote in 1860. And for me, at least, when I go then to the surviving copies of the weekly Iowa Post from Des Moines, which you might be able to see there if my laser pointer um, does its job, but don't worry about it. Um, anyways, this is the Des Moines paper. This was one of the Republican, uh, German American Republican papers at the time. Often, and this is true for English language papers as well, um, there's a strong party affiliation for any given uh, paper. So here, I'm just gonna cut down to this uh, section in boldface. This is not on your handout. But I, for me, I, I detect a note of frustration and pleading in this Republican editor's plea for Germans, German Iowans, to vote Republican. Germans, consider carefully that when you vote the Democratic ticket, you're also helping to spread slavery. And what German can be so conscienceless and behave so senselessly as to damn a fellow human, even one of another skin color, to slavery? So this is part of the political discourse um, as well, even though in this particular context we're not getting prohibition made uh, expressly. So I'm going to fast forward here a little bit up until 1880, which is when the next um, wave of prohibition starts. Um, Lincoln's success and Republicans' fiscal conservatism appealed to many German Iowans. So you have, um, in the period from 1858 uh, forward, you have German Americans also voting Republican. In fact, you'll see a table here in a moment where uh, it's clear in the, in the most predominantly German counties, uh, Republicans have majorities. Nonetheless, during the same period, the temperance movement continued to grow in strength, and to secure the support of temperance voters, Iowa Republicans promised to pass a prohibition amendment to the state constitution, and this is uh, the same procedure as exists now. You have the legislature has to pass this in two consecutive sessions of the, the legislature. So in 1880 and in 1882, Republican-controlled legislatures pass the wording for this prohibition amendment that is then put to a vote in 1882. And this was one of the strictest prohibition laws in the country uh, and outlawed the manufacturing consumption of all alcoholic beverages. And lo and behold, this, this leads to a party swing among uh, German American voters. So this is a, a table here from this particular study, um, published, this is a reprint, but it's uh, from 2008. And you can see in the top, so these are voting patterns in the 14 predominantly German Iowan counties from 1876 to 1896. Percent Republican is that first line. And you can see in 1876, 55% Republican, 56% Republican, Boom, starting in the 1882 referendum, okay, 39% are voting for the amendment to go dry, uh, which was a Republican um, policy. Uh, and then the support continues to drop, 44%, 44% in 1888, 36%, 36%. And in 1890, uh, Iowa has its first Democratic governor in you know, 30 years or so. so German Iowans are also impacting the vote uh, and the swing to go Democrat in the state. Uh, um, we will see, come 1896, the prohibition law is, as, um, is annulled, uh, and there's a, a new um, local option version, which explains why the Republicans gain more support again in 1896. And I should say the referendum actually only lasts for approximately a year because a very um, clever 
a German-American lawyer from Davenport, figures out that the House version and the Senate version have a slight discrepancy. Uh, it's taken to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court annuls the constitutional amendment. The Republicans, nonetheless, and the temperance advocates come right back, and then in 1884, they pass legislation, not as a constitutional amendment, but simply as a statewide law, to uh, enact prohibition again. And that stays in place for 10 years. This has widespread uh, implications also for national elections as well. So here, this is the 1884 election between Grover Cleveland, James G. Blaine. You're likely to only know one of those names, and that's because German Iowans helped to vote in Grover Cleveland. And here, this is also newspaper coverage from Carroll. Germans for Cleveland, why the president of the National Brewers Association, uh, a Republican businessman, will not vote for Blaine. Okay. Um, so I have a couple maps now, and I want you to just see the overlap between the counties that are most heavily German. So here, the dark brown counties, um, these counties have 2,500 or more German-born citizens. They were born in Germany and traveled at some point to the United States, to Iowa. Um, so um, German immigration starts along the Mississippi. The Missouri at some point is also made navigable, so you have a lot of, uh, you have Council Bluffs and Sioux City are also strong centers. And then in general, the northern half of the state fills in, it's the most German area of, um, of Iowa, the south, less so in the south. Ottumwa is a, an exception. So that's the German population pattern. And then if you compare it to the voting habits, the voting outcomes, county by county, for example, this 1882 Prohibition Amendment. All of the counties here in red are the counties that were opposed. And if we just toggle back, it's pretty much an overlap. Uh, so these German Iowans are voting against Prohibition. And then um, let's look at some of the broader implications for brewery culture, saloon culture, et cetera, et cetera. So here you have, this is the, the one source, uh, uh, a hobby historian, a labor of love, put together the, the breweries of Iowa, and has this chart on the number of breweries. So where there's a microbrewery revival now, um, I don't know the number of breweries uh, in the state. I think one or two of you might actually know that right now. Um, microbreweries are becoming popular. This microbrewery culture was already in place in the 19th century. Pretty much any town that had more than even just 1,000 residents was, was likely to have had a brewery. So you see, up until things peak right here, um, pardon me, 138 is 1878. Things go down a little bit, and then here, 1884, that's when the, this very strict prohibition law is enacted, and boom. You just go down, and in 1890, that's the, the low point in 23. The numbers start to go up, but this is also a time of consolidation. So this, this, the, the period of small, sort of handcrafted, uh, mom and pop brewing, if you want to put it in, the, in, that, uh, in those terms, that's over. And then industrialization starts. So you can see even though the, the number of breweries stays about the same, the output uh, continues to grow. This is also the, the period of time when Pabst, An An Anheuser Busch, Anheuser Busch, Schlitz, et cetera, et cetera, they are consolidating their markets and um, shipping nationally as well. This is a county by county overview of what happens to saloons uh, in Iowa following this vote. So all of the solid red counties, there were saloons prior to the prohibition law saloons remain in place, even though the law technically is putting them out of business. It's the uh, shaded, red shaded areas where saloons go out of business. And I want to point now to, to contrast the situation in Carroll and the situation in Johnson County. Okay, Johnson County is shaded area. Johnson County loses its saloons. Carroll is German enough that it doesn't. So here's Carroll. Okay. This is the Carroll Democrat from uh, the 8th of August, 1884. It's in your packet. Um, this is an open, uh, you know, uh, anyone who could read German, and not everyone could, uh, the Germans are just talking about themselves. Don't worry about it. 
Okay? Everyone is convinced that no one here in Carroll will want to take anything against saloon owners, even the prohibitionists, as long as saloon owners conduct themselves more or less reputably. We hope as well that saloon owners will follow this course. We are convinced that the drunkards, apparent from time to time on the streets, did not get drunk in saloons because, as we hear, no, as we have personally assured ourselves, saloon owners are extremely careful with the sale of alcohol. Okay, and I'll let you uh, read the rest of that uh, in your packet. So this is the situation in Carroll. How do things look in Johnson County? It's a completely different situation, and s some of you already may know this article by Marlon Ingalls. It appeared in the Little Village in uh, March of 2013 about local beer riots. In other words, when the prohibitionists and local temperance advocates, pardon me, uh, try and enforce this 1884 prohibition law, there are riots. Um, and, and yet, Johnson County does not have a strong enough German majority population to resist these efforts. So over time, uh, Iowa, Johnson County goes dry. Okay? Um, and the brewery owners are major protagonists in uh, the, these riots. Very briefly, on 13th of August, 1884, John Dostel, Great Western Brewery, and Graf of the Union Brewery, as Mark Fullenkamp pointed out, were required to stand trial at the home of Justice of the Peace, John Schell, in Scott Township for having distributed beer in violation of the new law. A mob accompanied the men to Schell's home, tarred the prosecuting attorney, and upon return to IC, severely beat one of the alleged informants. And the word on the street was that um, the, the prohibitionists were paying informants to go and snitch, if you will, on the, on the brewery owners. Okay. Um, I, you know, I've, I, there, there are a couple other um, discussions of this. The State Historical Society has a couple write-ups. <coughs> and I was always just puzzled. Why are they going out to Scout, Scott Township? And it wasn't until I looked at um, both this uh, report from Carroll. This, was, this made not just statewide news, but national news, these riots in Iowa City. Uh, and I also, I'll show some uh, township voting records in just a second, which helped me, I think, to at least make a plausible theory for what's going on. So according to the German perspective here, if acts of violence against the lackeys of the prohibitionists occur here and there in Iowa, then the prohibitionists are themselves to blame, for it was precisely they who first broke the law in their blind rage by vastly exceeding the provisions of the Prohibition Act. The Law and Order League presumes the right to circumvent district attorneys by means of venal lawyers and twisters of the law, whom they pay to target saloon owners and brewers and to drag them before rural justices of the peace who are eager to do their will, even when the circuit court has denied justices of the peace any jurisdiction over matters of prohibition. Two respected brewers of Iowa City, the county seat, were dragged in front of a justice of the peace out in the country, namely in Scott Township, not at the instigation of the district attorney, but rather by the private lawyer of the local law and order society. At this, the blood of the opponents of prohibition tyranny began to boil. More than a hundred of them grabbed the paid lawyer and informant for the Law and Order League, stripped him naked in the street, coated him with tar, and chased him away. Okay. But this particular editor, this is actually, it's from Carroll Democrat, but it's, um, it's, they're actually copying a report from the Illinois state newspaper, the Staatszeitung. So this is the, also the Illinois take on things. Not much apology here. So this is not to condone the behavior of the local brewers, but to explain it at least a little bit, particularly why Scott Township. So this here is from the history of Johnson County from 1883, which has a chart of the vote on the 1882 amendment in Johnson County by township. And if you go to the Iowa City results, um, the middle column is for the amendment, the right column is against the amendment, and you can see uh, in the north part of town, which was Goose Town, and where a lot of the, the Germans were in, uh, living, you had 158 for the amendment, in favor of prohibition, 541 against the amendment. So strong opposition. You go to Scott Township, you have 126 for the amendment, 34 
against the amendment. So Scott Township was clearly, of all, of all the townships in Johnson County, it was the one location where there is strong majority, strong support for this prohibition legislation. Why schlep, why uh, drag the Iowa City Brewers out to the country, out to Scott Township, rather than having a trial here in, in town? The advocates of prohibition, perhaps um, justifiably, were concerned that they would not get a fair hearing in Iowa City, um, and they were all the more assured that they could probably get a prosecution in Scott Township, given the voting records. Okay, and I know I'm nearly out of time here. Uh, here, for those of you, where is Scott Township? There is Scott Township. Um, okay, I do want to make sure we have time for questions. I will, um, I do not want to, sorry, forget <laughs> that um, this also, uh, the issue of prohibition plays a huge role regarding the vote in Iowa on women's suffrage in 1916. This is a topic of uh, the last article that you have in your packet. I simply encourage you to read that article as well where it's clear that German, male German Iowans are not going to give women the vote because they're concerned that women are gonna vote for prohibition. So if you, again, look at the voting results this is a pretty good overlap with the counties with strong German heritage. And this then also just feeds into <laughs> the, the local prohibition, uh, you know, the support for prohibition at the national level once World War I comes along as well. So um, the German propensity for beer is blamed in part for a wasting of resources for the war effort, and this uh, helps to explain why prohibition goes national in 1920. Um, I have been asked to uh, close with a couple call for actions. You're all local. I very much wanted this to be a, a local uh, talk. Um, how can you get involved? Uh, and you know, um, how much you engage with the University of Iowa and the research here at the University of Iowa. One way would be to just go to the local exhibit that we have. It's up in the old Capitol Museum until um, January 8th. Um, we encourage you to go visit that. If you are of German descent, and I'm just, I'm curious, could I have a show of hands? How many of you are of German heritage? Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased and I'm not surprised. Um, and I appreciate the, the interest quite sincerely. Um, our project, in many ways, we're trying to connect the dots between what's the, the immigration story that's out there in the larger public consciousness, which is largely just the exceptional communities of the Amanas and uh, the, um, the Amish community in, in Kelowna, with the family stories and community stories, bottom up, if you will, that all of you are aware of. I'm assuming that several of you have um, stories that have been handed down from generation to generation. We're trying to fill in those middle gaps. We can't do it, we can't write this history without documentation. So if you have family documents, whether or not you, you would be willing to part with the originals or not, you might uh, wish to consider whether you uh, might want to donate some materials to some of the local uh, archives. Um, and then I'll just note um, my own motivation for getting involved in this project was when the Iowa City School District decided to cancel the local uh, German program here. So um, I hope that that won't happen to other um, programs in the state. And if, and we, again, to write this portion of state history, we need students, young, the younger generation, trained in German. So if this is of concern to you as well, I encourage you to contact your state decision makers, local school boards, to encourage German instruction in schools. Um, that is all. Thank you very much, and I encourage your, your questions here. Thank you. Yes? They, they were, they were um, often British or, or American. To, to hear the Germans tell it, they are of Puritan strain. Uh, and um, they're, they're often coming from, the, from New England. So um, those, whoever's moving to Iowa from New England tends to bring a rather um, ascetic worldview uh, with them and uh, you know, uh, supports blue laws 
that would uh, prevent drinking, gambling, even card playing and dancing uh, in public on Sundays, for example. Yes? In 1860, you just said that there was a, a, a large anti-immigration movement about whether or not they would have voting rights. Wasn't the bulk of the population immigrants at that point? Well, um, and yes. Well, OK. The German population, this is actually on the chart uh, on the flip side of your first page. You can kind of track what percentage of the total Iowa population is made up of the German population. It's growing in the 1860s. It hasn't peaked yet. Um, you the, the first wave of settlement in Iowa is largely American-based. So um, the, the immigrants are coming in, but it's not yet they're, they're not so prevalent and populous um, and, and large of a growing voting group that they can really sway things. And um, in general, Iowa, this is also you know, just part of the, the overall dynamics. Once Iowa develops this reputation as a sort of stronghold of prohibition, this does send some German immigrants elsewhere. So Milwaukee, you, know, the, you have these issues in Wisconsin, in Minnesota, in Illinois as well, but you don't have majority temperance support, uh, which pushes through these, these prohibition laws. There might be local, local dry counties. You have to remember, uh, the Black Hawk War takes place in 1840. Mark, could you maybe just briefly mention your, your own personal background? Because you come from a yeah, Mississippi. I come from Lee County, Iowa, and that was all white Anglo Saxon Protestants. But then here come these Germans with their breweries. There were three breweries in Fort Madison. I grew up in a house built in 1846 in the back pasture. There was a brewery. And when we were kids, we dug up the tunnels and built forts and stuff. And, stuff. and I didn't know that Prohibition hit in 1884. But uh, I, while I was looking up stuff for Glenn and Glenn, I found out that one of my ancestors was the owner of that brewery. You know, as soon as you know the temperance movement comes back in the 1870s, the Germans start changing the um, dialogue, the marketing. So the United States Brewers Association, American Brewers Association, they're trying to get in with the temperance movement to say beer is in, in the temperance. Yeah, exactly. it's not whiskey. So they're trying to make it seem that beer is okay, but the whiskey, yeah, you guys can get rid of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and the, the Brewers Association has magazines, uh, an annual, and you can look at it. And so when they get rid of the prohibition, the Heil family in Burlington ordered all the brewing equipment from a Chicago company to build their brewery in Burlington again after Prohibition. Okay, thanks. I want to make sure we have time for two or three more questions at least. Uh, where was the Englert Brewery? You showed that, you the Englert was right across from the other, the Dostal Brewery. So Market, um, you know, that, that was Brewery Row. Uh, from John's Grocery, which also is where the, the German men's choir met and the, the German aid society. Uh, so the, the smaller parking lot, because it, uh, the Englert Brewery was the first brewery, um, it, was, it was smaller. The technology uh, wasn't as fully developed, if you will, or it wasn't, um, this, they didn't have the, it down quite uh, as much. And so um, the capacity was always smaller. Uh, but anyways, it's that parking lot between the law offices and the, um, the coffee house right there.